this process was really something which make me review one more time all the elements, all the sadness, all the pity, all the emotional tragedy I went through, but also make me remind how I went survive this kind of storm. And today I feel like I'm happiest than I ever been because somehow I leveraged myself to become, to reinvent myself, to rebirth, because you cannot just cope and follow up with the tragedy like that thinking you're strong enough to take it, thinking you're strong enough to just, okay, that's going to be fine. I, let's focus on my work. You cannot put yourself with a, a distraction. You have to really go into the depth of the losing. You have to really embrace the fact you, you're weak and you accept the, the tragedy as something can really change your life. You can put yourself vulnerable enough to say, what am I going to do next? What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace. And before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Joining me now, First Class Father, Hicks and Gracie. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, my brother. It's great to be with you. All right, let's just start right here. How many kids do you have? How old are they? Oh, I, I used to have four. Now I have three kids, two girls, one with 32, another with 35, and Crone, the youngster, with 31. Very cool. Um, if you could, Hickson, just for the, for the people here, if you could just hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Yes, I'm coming from the Gracie family who has introduced Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to the, to the world. You know, my family is a very interesting family because we all created to be part of a clan of martial artists. So the challenge, the pressure, the, the ability to deal with, with you know, with our essential abilities to compete and fight, are being, you know, being very much uh, dedicated. My, my parents dedicate their lives to, to build up a clan of, of fighters. Family is being traditionally involved in martial arts since the beginning of the century. When the Japanese uh, champion in jiu-jitsu coming, arrive in Brazil, to retire and become like a, a immigration process manager. So becomes friends of my grandfather, and then he start teach jiu-jitsu to my uncle, which is the older brother of the five brothers of the Gracie clan. And then he start to learn jiu-jitsu, and then he passed through the family, and they opened the first school in 1925 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And since then, we've been traditionally involved in martial arts to develop the, not only the ability to fight, but also the ability to, to provide self-confidence and, and bringing a lot of uh, beneficial aspects for the community through the self-defense of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, there, there's no doubt your family is responsible for so many people around the world, millions of people uh, taking up the practice of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's exciting to see so many kids getting involved in it nowadays, too. And that all goes to your family. Um, take me back to the beginning of your fatherhood journey here, Hickson. About how old were you when you first became a dad and how did becoming a father kind of change your perspective on life? So I was young, like 21 year old, and then I have my first kid which was like amazing transformation in my life because, you know, you become not only a father, but you become with a purpose of raising the kid the best you can and make him just like you and try to bring all the elements you have in your personality and your culture to bring in to favor the kid to, for him to become the best he can be, and if it's possible, representing the family in jiu-jitsu. So it was amazing transformation in my head. Yeah, and one of the things uh, I love to ask the dads, uh, as far as discipline, I know one of the things of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the discipline that it requires to practice. What type of disciplinarian are you as a dad with the kids growing up, and is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Yeah, discipline. Kids don't like discipline. They don't like, you know, become like 
part of a system. They want to improvise. They want to be happy. They want to play when it's a serious thing. So they want to be like in their own pattern. I like to combine that kind of friendly attitude to take care of my kids without too much pressure with the enthusiasm they should have to, 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 cope, to cope with their necessities of or f- fulfill their purpose. So for me, I have to be father, I have to be a good friend, I have to be a good supporter of their endeavors. So I always give them advices, I always make them feel like they deserve what they get because one of the problems I feel like is sometimes you spoil your kid because you love them so much and you bring gifts without reason, you bring something for them to feel your love, but your love coming with some kind of unbalanced situation because they don't have to receive gifts because you love them or because you think them cute. So I, I make sure in my when I deal with my kids, it's always about, you like that skate? Oh, yeah, dad, can you bite me? That skateboard is great. Okay, that's cool. So let's see. What color you like? What wheels? What this? So that will be nice. You can jump here and there. Okay, great. But what you going to do to deserve this? Oh, dad, I can, I can put the trash out. I, can, I will speak well with my sister. I'm going to be nice with my mother. I'm going to put my shoes. Whatever their, their, their ability, I mean, whatever they need to cope with some kind of process of feeling, they deserve it. They, they receive something. But I keep, the, I keep the trash out of the thing for the whole week or I clean the car, or I help my father to, to, whatever the chores are, it's not about pressure, but it's about for them to feel, I deserve the bike, I make, so they give them a sense of empowerment, a sense of responsibility. In terms of discipline, I like to, in a, in a, in a trail where they love to be, so the discipline comes naturally. You know, if you like to play soccer, if you don't like to play soccer, it's, no, it's not about discipline and, and make him feel he has to do it. So the discipline is more to follow with their senses in terms of because at the end of the day, you have to follow. The father has to be smart enough to, to, to provide for the kid the environment, for him to feel comfortable and for him to feel ex- motivated for him to feel excited to accomplish things, for him to feel notice about what has he has he had done. So the parent is not there to guide the kid about, no, I know the direction you should go. Not about that. It's about wherever you want to go, let's go with intelligence. Let's go with discipline. Let's go with respect. Let's go with, with strategy. Let's go with a game plan. Let's go with motivation. So all the elements, the positive elements to, to embrace their mission, their desire. So especially those days which a lot of information on the, on the kids' heads is important for, for the parent be a friend enough to discover what he has to do to achieve a greatness or get better. So I feel like discipline is part of the game, but... It's not about imposing discipline. It's about making him understand how important it is to have discipline in his life to achieve anything. Yeah, very well said, Hickson. And definitely a message that we need today. I know we see a lot of entitlement from a lot of kids today, and it's causing a lot of devastation. I know we live in this culture now where it's every kid gets a trophy, and that philo- philosophy has been really a colossal failure, uh, especially here in the United States. So definitely working to achieve success is definitely more rewarding when you work for something than as opposed to when it's given to you. So I, I love what you say there. And then I- I'm going to jump into your book here, Breathe a Life in Flow. But one question I have, I know obviously you- you've had unfortunately lost one of your children. I've had several Several dads on the podcast here that have had to bury their kids at the most uncomfortable conversations to really have because it's a yeah. devastating ordeal. Um, what was the process like for you writing the book and going back into this experience of, of finding out and losing your child? What was that like for you? Was it difficult to get through as you were writing the book? And how was that process? This process, this process was really something which make me review one more time all the elements, all the sadness, all the pity, all the, 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 the emotional tragedy I went through 
but also make me remind how I went and and, and survive this kind of this kind of storm. And today I feel like I'm happiest than I ever been because somehow I leverage myself to become to reinvent myself to rebirth because you cannot just cope and follow up with the tragedy like that thinking you're strong enough to take it thinking you're strong enough to just okay that's going to be fine I, let's focus on my work you cannot put yourself with a, a distraction you have to really go into the depth of the losing no matter if you lose a child no matter if you lose your job no matter if whatever you're losing and you feel bad you have to really embrace the fact you you weak and you accept the, 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 the tragedy as something can really change your life. You can put yourself vulnerable enough to say, what am I going to do next? I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be... So you want to put yourself open, open your heart and accept. And that's what I did. And after maybe, I say, three or two, four years of, of completely numbness and without the desire to just compete or or practice or or having any kind of situation where i feel like oh i'm gonna surf so i lost the appetite for surfing for training for enjoying with my friends i was just self putting myself on the on the garden on the on the trees and on the backyard of my house so all this was just something which I allowed my sadness to just take over and, 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 and be very fragile, crying a lot. But after that, I decided to, one day I was, you know, and on, the side, on the hillside with many trees and stuff, and I climbed a tree and I saw a huge, a beautiful view from the, for the ocean. And I felt like I have to pay some kind of... Uh, sacrifice for my kid something i have to do to honor his life so i create a platform a wood platform on the top of the the the, the, the tree which take me about three weeks you know by myself from from the first light in the morning to the night to dawn you know bleeding my hands and, and being upside down on the tree making holes and things so eventually i make a little platform which is beautiful all varnished beautiful wood and i put his picture I put it, you know, I meditate there, I breathe, I think about him. It like take something very heavy from me. I, I built something for him, giving all my best. So I felt like it was the effort which relieved myself from the pressure, from the, from the set. But I still not quite finding happiness. And then I maybe after six months of going off and on, on and meditating and breathing i remember my family something he said nothing can be com nothing can be completely right nothing can be completely good or completely bad so it's always a little some opposite in everything you do so thinking about that i was thinking how my departure of my son could, could help me or could be po positive in my life and then I realized up to that point, I was in charge of my time. I was the happiest father in the world. I could control time and control if I'm going to fight somebody, if I buy a house. If I go. So I was in charge. And after that tragedy, I felt like tomorrow may never ha happen. And you have to be much more concerned about what you do today. And before, if my son coming to me and say, Dad, I'd like to talk to you. I could say to him, awesome, take a time, man. I go surf. When I come back, we talk. Maybe tomorrow we talk. Because I'm in today, if I'm going to the airport for assignment in Japan, and my, my daughter called me and said, Dad, I have to talk to you, and she's crying or something, I will stop the car in the freeway and talk to her with all the calmness in the world to see, to try to support, to do. And after the long conversation, whatever it takes to, to, to finish this at my best of my abilities. And then if I still have time to get the airplane, I will take it. If not, I will reschedule, I will do whatever. So today I'm very grateful because today I know how to use my day to much more purpose, with much more intelligence, with much more positiveness and 
not wasting time, not leaving things for tomorrow, not feeling I'm in charge of time because I'm not. So I'm thankful for, for the Hoxos departure because he taught me something which make my life a better life, a more special life, a more precise life, which no wasting, which no, I don't waste my time with things I don't believe. You know, our conversation today is so important for me as for you, as for the listeners. And I feel like is is an important, valuable thing. And when I finish this, I will do something also important. And I, 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 I put myself in a much better perspective from now to the end of my days. Yeah, and I'm well, happy for it. Extremely well said, Hickson. And, and, and I know that the book is selling like hotcakes right now on Amazon. Breathe, a life in flow. Uh, yeah. what, what made you, why did you decide to, to, to write the book? And, and what has been the feedback you've gotten from the book so far? So the decision of the book was about, first, a good money proposal. So that's in the, in the pandemic times, it's something you cannot, you know, disregard. So with the possibility to make some money, I, I put together with my friend Peter Maguire, who is a great writer, is a scholar and good friend for a long time. So he helped me to write the book. And the feedback I have from the book is very, very, very special because I opened my heart. I talk about not only the good things in my life, but I talk about my losses. I talk about my, my young ages and my, you know, my marriage, my flaws in my marriage, you know, times full with drugs. And so all this is part of my open heart life, which by exposing that, I, I show the word. I'm not a special guy. I'm not a god. I'm not a you know I'm a, a, a guru or something. I'm a normal person who makes mistakes or not. And from mistakes I learn. So I feel like anyone can learn from mistakes. Anyone can have a better and for happiness because in the end of the day, no matter if you're fighting an opponent, no matter if you want to buy a car, no matter if you want to get a girlfriend, no matter if you want to raise your kids, we all going to face challenges, obstacles, disagreements, and, and pressure. And based on breathing, which was the, is, the, is the central point of my learning process in life, when I start to learn how to breathe, I start to bring in more spiritual guidance. I start to bring in more comfortable in my heart because the lungs has the the beneficial aspects to deeply interfere in your brain and your heart, which are the only organs in your body who give and receive information. So when you breathe properly in a full capacity, which is completely different than you learn how to breathe when you get slapped on your butt and you start to cry when you're born and you just breathe. Ah, ah, ah. When you learn how to use the diaphragmatic breathe and you start to using a full lung capacity, you become a completely more uh, in control of your heartbeats and your tiredness and your overventilation and your emotions, your peace of mind, your, your, your anxiety, your depression. So breathing can be a big facilitator in your life for you to combine with good strategies and positive thoughts to really change your life for better. So all this makes me feel like through this book is a great beginning to people see average Joes can really have a great lifestyle if you see life as a, a metaphor for, for fighting. In the past, I like to fight for win. And to win without a fight. Using the same invisible concepts as whole faith, visualization, you know, positiveness, so and, and others. So when you be able to really come everything good you have inside, you become another person to the universe and you become, you know, and the and the good path for conquering happiness. Yeah, great, st great stuff, Hickson. I'm going to uh, drop a link to the book, Breathe, A Life in Flow, in the description of today's podcast episode so my listeners can tap the link, get over there and check it out. Um, I listen, obviously, you're a legend in the world of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a legend in the world of MMA. What would you consider, what do you want your legacy to be as a dad? Oh, man, I just want to be feeling like I was supportive 
I was friendly, I was respectful, I was humble, I was putting, dedicating 100% of my attention on raising my kids and give them what they, everything they need. But, you know, I don't raise them for myself. I feel like my love, my concerns, my respect, my advices are the, are the bow who's going to put pressure and throw the arrow, which they are the arrow, and go. And I don't know where they're going to land. I, don't, I just expect them to go as free, as strong, as empowered, as happy as they can be to the, to the something I, I don't know. So I just did my mission and expecting the best. But, you know, we have to think about God's in, in top of all of us, guide us and, and, and give us directions we cannot explain. So we have to, I'm happy to do what I did, but I'm not sure about the outcome. I'm very positive, though. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. What's next for you here, Hicks? And what kind of goals or plans do you have here for yourself? What's next for you? I have the Hickson Dot Academy, which I try to bring to sheets more accessible for people in terms of, you know, bringing concepts, bringing ideas of breathing, exercising, understanding your leverage, your empowerment, not to fight, but to give you the confidence you can, you have a, a backup plan in case you need it. And that's going to give you more sharpness in your mind, better ways to deal with pressure, so the Hickson Dot Academy is being my platform now for being, you know, serving the universe as you know, as I live. And uh, and other than that, I maybe in the future try to make some motivational speeches about empowerment and so on. So let's see how it takes. But I'm very happy to just bring that spiritual aspect of me to the people. Very cool. And the last thing I want to hit you with here, Hicks, and I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? Okay, man. That's, I mean, first you blessing by having a kid. So that's a gift you have to honor and, and something which is, because in my opinion, the best things in life money cannot buy. So your relation with your kid has to be based on, on fundamental as, as respect each other, love each other, and 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 not try to favor your kid with things just because you didn't have a skateboard when you were at that age. You don't have to give him for free just for him to experiment something without giving you the right value. So make sure in any age, from, from very early age, he should get a gift, but he should at least put his shoes close to the to the, the 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 bed or just talk not loud talk talk a little low slower for me so whatever he needs to learn and and his age he needs to understand he did this and he deserves something because he did right so giving the support of the kid but also give the orientation and make him choose right and wrong is crucial for the youngest fathers because you don't have to force anything, but you have to just keep his eyes open. And he will choose the best sometimes. And if you choose the wrong ways, you have to say, okay, now is your choice. You choose wrong. See, you're going to pay for it. So for him to understand, you're not dictating what you're saying, but you just is a friend who's there to help. Very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Hicks and Gracie, your first class father all the way. Thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. My pleasure, my brother. God bless. Talk to you soon, okay?